and welcome to another edition of ESPN FC with me, Ross Dyer, alongside Steve Nicol, Alejandro Moreno and Shaka Hislop. We've got loads to get through today. We're talking Coutinho, Liverpool and Brazil. We're talking about Kaká. We're talking with Adrian Heath, all things Everton. But before we get to all of that, let's start off with the news that David De Gea has reportedly asked not to be included in Manchester United squad for the Aston Villa game or at the moment given what has been going on with him being dropped from the team. Louis van Gaal has obviously had his say on this. Where do you see this going? What is De Gea playing at? I, I have no idea. And I have to say, on the one hand, uh, for David De Gea to make this request, as, as has been reported, it suggests that the deal is done, he's just biding his time, he wants to make sure he's fit for that move. Saying that, I don't sympathise with that at all. It's, I, I feel, as a player, you play. You let the transfer speculation, you let the moves take care of themselves. When you start taking stances like this, I think it reflects badly on you as a player and as a professional, and it should concern Real Madrid. On, on the other, if this is David De Gea trying to play a trump card against Manchester United, who've been stalling themselves, the knock-on effect in the dressing room can hurt Louis van Gaal and... and their own prospects for, for this season. Shaka, let's just say for sake of argument that for whatever reason, the deal falls through, mm -hmm. which we've seen happen, that at times deal that seem they're 100% done, they're not 100% done, and all of a sudden, David De Gea has to stay with Manchester United. How does this then change the dynamic of David De Gea and Louis van Gaal going forward? Well, if, if the deal falls through, David De Gea has shot himself in, in, in yeah. the foot. Listen, if, if David De Gea is saying, I'm not playing for now, you know, we're all sitting here, and certainly I was thinking before this statement that, that it was done. It was only a matter of time before he's gone. Mm. If he's coming out and saying for now, that means it's not done. And but the I fact that he's doing this tells me that he's had enough of Van Hal. Van Hal criticised him in pre-season. He left him out of the squad at the weekend. This is a little bit of tit for tat saying, you know what? I'm not playing. If he's saying he's not playing for now, as you put it, Stevie, is also David De Gea saying, I'll be back in soon enough, which, given Sergio Romero's performance in the first game, I'm not so sure. And yes, David De Gea was Manchester United's best player last season, but possession is nine-tenths of the law, and when you give it up and when you hand it off in, in this manner, I think it reflects badly on you, on your team, and it gives Sergio Romero the opportunity that he's been waiting for. Possession is what? Nine-tenths of the law. <laughs> Just learned something today. <laughs> I'll, I'll teach you something every Thank day. Thank you. I like appreciate that. The, the power play seems to be uh, at stake here for De Gea. Obviously, the Fanal thing, you can pretty much forget that, can't you? This is effectively saying, I'm going to Madrid, whether you like it or not. And doesn't it weaken Manchester United's hand and Van Gaal's hand? Because he's ostracised Valdez. He's now got De Gea playing mutiny a little bit. He's got Romero, but for how long is he going to be a decent enough one, uh, number one for them? Well, he got... <laughs> He's getting away with Romero because he got away with the weekend. You know, to play a goalkeeper who basically has had no pre-season, has, has not played with the players in front of him, was a huge gamble. Now, on this occasion, he came up trumped. Romero ended up being the man of the match. Everything in the garden is rosy. But the fact that Romero has no pre-season behind him means that, you know what, it's going to catch up with him. Mistakes are going to be made. And I think, I think the hair knows this is going to happen. And this is, this is a perfect time for him to down tools. OK, well, let's take a look at the predictions. Uh, it doesn't seem to have affected okay. what we think is going to happen All right, against Shaka. Aston Villa. Manchester uh -huh. United, clear winners on all four fronts here. Uh, certainly a clear winner in Shaka's well, mind. Clearly, I think that David De Gea is preventing Manchester United from scoring goals somehow <laughs> or the other. <laughs> this is Where's more it? a reflection of how, Aston Villa. how poorly we think Absolutely. Aston Villa looked against Bournemouth and the fact that we do not believe that Aston Villa I, can, I, can in any way compete with Manchester United at this point? No, and, and especially when you look at the history between these two, I think it's an easy Manchester United win. What about recent history? Where are these three goals coming from? Man United could hardly muster a shot at goal at home at the weekend. When it was three, Aston Villa. Was three goals the result. <laughs> when you look at all the big boys, Manchester City uh, apart, they all struggled. They all just trying to get the cobwebs out. You watch. <laughs> they, they, they you watch. <laughs> they all struggled. Okay, yeah, well, right. we're about to find out. Obviously, the big logic. game looking forward to on Sunday as well <laughs> is Chelsea's trip to Manchester City. But we're not talking about the two points dropped by Jose Mourinho's team on the opening day against Swansea. We're not talking about the red card for Thibaut Courtois. We're talking about the doctors 
Why are we talking about the doctors still? He's got the press conference scheduled for 12.30 London time where we hope he's going to give us a little bit of insight. But Eden Hazard going down injured, the doctor's going on to treat him. Mourinho has let this story run and run and run. Why, oh, why, oh, why? It becomes a story because Jose Mourinho made it a story. Mm. We don't sit here and say, well, what are we going to talk about this week? Well, let's talk about the team doctors for Chelsea. No, it becomes a story because of the way that Jose Mourinho has handled the situation or mishandled the, t the situation. The doctors were called in by the referee. They go in and do their job. But obviously, in, in my mind, I just simply think that Jose Mourinho wanted to get rid of these doctors to begin with, and he found a reason that was convenient enough for him to criticize them, to jump on the doctors, and now out they go. I, I have to 100% agree with you, Ali, uh, because this, this was really simple. If he really thought that they just ran on, all he has to do is sit them down in the, in the, the office after the game or on the Monday morning and ask them a simple question. Were you told to come on? The answer is yes, the matter should have been done and dusted. He clearly has another, definitely another agenda. He wants rid of them, and this is why we're talking about it. Now. On the one hand, you want to say this is nothing new. Whenever Chelsea drop points, we seem to be talking about something else other than Chelsea dropping points for a full week until, until they win again. On the other, this topic and how it's rumbled, how it's snowballed, and how it hasn't been addressed by Jose Mourinho or Chelsea, and the topics that it covers... I think is, is concerning on a number of levels. That's your friend. That's your friend, Jose Mourinho. Huh? It's, it's, and it remains concerning boy. on a number of levels that I, I, I don't see how Chelsea or Jose Mourinho come out of this um, in, in any kind of positive way. Well, now, let's look at the game against Manchester City coming up. Obviously, a huge, huge game for him. Big pressure on him after the opening day result as well. Given the way that he was really upset with what happened with Eden Hazard, leaving them exposed, as it were, him coming off, having received the treatment, it wasn't the problem that they were really exposed down their own right back position time and time again by Swansea. And the real gripe he should be having is how to defend down that side. If you're Manuel Pellegrini, you must look at this and say, Raheem Sterling, today is your day. Listen, I think you have to look at the performance of Ivanovic in that game at Swansea um, as a one-off. It looked like a player who wasn't quite ready. And considering what he's done in the last two or three seasons for Chelsea, I, I think you give him that. On the other hand, Come on, I think this Stevie, is a good... Stevie, Jeff I think he made Jefferson Montero look like he was a world beater. But it's a, it's a first game of the season. He's not 100%. How many times can you remember Ivanovic in the last two or three seasons getting done? Well, never mind, never mind embarrassed. Actually coming off the field and being outplayed by the guy he was against. But hold on a second. Not only getting done... Uh, there were times where Jefferson Montero was simply just running by Ivanovic, like Ivanovic wasn't even there. And classic, for me, that well, yes, classic preseason. But I would say Raheem Sterling is a better version of Jefferson Montero, and so you would expect well, some sort of performance from Raheem Sterling if you're well, a Manchester you know, City fan. Do you know what the the good thing for Chelsea and Ivanovic is? Is that Manchester City only know how to play one way, mm -hmm. and that's going forward. This 100% suits the way Chelsea sit in nice and tight get men behind the ball, and that way, I don't think Ivanovic gets exposed. OK. Thanks, guys. After the break, Stevie's old mate, Everton legend and now MLS manager Adrian Heath joins us to talk toffee. We're now joined by Everton legend Adrian Heath, now head coach of MLS and Kaká. Uh, MLS is Orlando City taking part in their first season in MLS. Welcome to the show, Adrian. The boys are standing by. Uh, I know Stevie's ready to talk all days with you in the Merseyside derby, but you were my favourite player mm. growing up. Uh -oh. So oh, oh, if they don't mind, I'm going to dominate oh, the interview. Uh, <laughs> Let's talk about Everton. You've got good for us, eh? <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> foremost, uh, Everton start to the weekend. What did you make of it uh, in the Premier League season with a 2-2 draw against Watford? Well, obviously, it's always difficult playing a promoted team, you know, with all the excitement they have with getting up to, to play in the Premier League. So it's, uh, it's never easy playing a promotion team, but obviously they'll be disappointed. You know, Goodison's traditionally a, a fortress for them, so they'll be disappointed to drop two points on the opening day. Um, obviously, the one thing that I know that Everton are going to need all their best players this year, like no Leighton Baines, Pinot's still not about, and I still think they've got to get uh, Lukaku going if they want to have a season like they had a couple of years ago. 
they had a quiet summer. Did Roberto Martinez do enough, do you think? Or, or, or maybe there's a little bit more to come. Of course, they've got Mason Holgate uh, signed up now. But do you think they need to do a little bit more in order to get that season that they had a couple of years ago you talked about? Well, I think he's still, Roberto keeps talking about signing another two or three players before the deadline. So hopefully he'll get them in. Hopefully there'll be people who can actually go into the team, not squad players. I think obviously Holgate's going to be one for the future, but I think he needs a bit of help with the first team. I think that if he can bring two or three pieces in and get all these first team fits, then there's no reason why I can't see him challenging to be where they were before. But certainly, you know, the likes of Baines and people like that, they need them around and they need to keep all the people like Stones. Where do you stand on the John Stones issue in terms of what Roberto Martinez has talked about now with the transfer window? He'd like to see that closed as soon as the Premier League kicks off. Do you think that that's a fair point or do you think it's open season? Well, I think it's open season if you're the buying club. I think if you're, you're the club that doesn't want to lose one of your players and you might lose him, say, 24 hours before the deadline closes when the season's still going on because the chances are of getting an adequate replacement are very, very difficult. But uh, I think that, that the window should be closed when the season opens. And obviously, obviously, Roberto's looking after his own ends. I understand Chelsea. I think the kid's a quality player. I think he's going to be a future England international. And I understand that why they want him. You know, with obviously, look at John Terry's age now and Kale. He looks like a perfect understudy for them. But from a purely Everton point of view, I hope they, they manage to keep hold of him. Adrian, you, you spoke about Martinez there. I, I'm, I'm going back to your old days with Howard Kendall. Uh, and you, of course, scored the goal against Oxford in the Cup in 83 that basically kept Howard his job. From there, it was just success for, for all of you. How, how key was Howard uh, in your career yeah. in bringing other players to the club to bring that success? I think the one thing about Howard, Stevie, and you know him well, he was a, a real player's man. You know, he gave you enough rope to hang, hang yourself, and some of, them, some of us did occasionally, but he was a great player's man. A credible Evertonian. He made everybody realise how important it was to play for the club. But I think if you look with Howard and Terry Darracott and Colin Harvey, they, we, had, we had great Evertonians in control of the club and in charge of them. And they made us all aware of our responsibilities about playing for the club, how important the club was. And I think, obviously, I, f I find myself lucky that I, I played for that great club for seven years. So, and I know the people I played with, the likes of Graham Sharp and Kevin Ratcliffe, Kevin Sheedy, all them guys that we had, all them, them great Merseyside derbies against you, Laura, at Liverpool. You know, it was a special time to be on Merseyside. And I, I look back on it with great memories, Stevie. Well, if you don't mind, Adrian, let's move on to current players and current coaches. And uh, Ross had mentioned the fact that you're now coaching Kaká, and so when Orlando City makes the mm. announcement that they're going to sign Kaká, everybody's excited because everybody knows of, of the talent that Kaká has had over the course of his career. But of course, yes. in the last few years, we haven't seen the best of Kaká. And yet, from the moment that he set foot in Orlando, he seemed to buy into whatever you guys were selling. What has mm. been the best part about coaching Kaká? Oh, it's a great question, Ali. I think the most important thing is that he wanted to be here. I know that he, he turned down incredible offers from Asia, you know, China and places like that. Far more money. He's getting handsomely paid where he is, but he, he turned down an awful lot of money to be here in Orlando. I think he believes in MLS. He wants to leave a legacy here like he has everywhere else. And I think the most important thing, Ali, is that he comes in every day like he would have done when he was 21. He's so much enthusiasm for the game. I talk to all our younger players every single day that if, if you want to emulate somebody in the game on and off the field, then you've got the best the best character reference you could ever have right in front of you every day. So it's been a pleasure for me. Um, I know it's been a pleasure for a lot of the players and I'm just so pleased. You know, I saw him this morning in the, in the weight room and he got that lovely big smile of his on it all over his face because he's been called back up into the Brazil national team. So like everybody connected with the club, we're absolutely delighted for him because I know how much it means to him. Adrian, just building, building on, on exactly that, I mean, Kaká has been instrumental to everything you've done this season. You're within touch and distance. Of, of the playoffs, mm -hmm. yet Kaká may be missing for you later on this season, having been called back yeah. in, into the Brazil national team. Can you cope without him? Well, we hope so, and we're going to have to, because, you know, obviously, it's not just Kaká, we'll be out Darwin Seren as well, and, you know, Kyle Laren, who's had a great first season for us, he'll be away with uh, Canada as well, so it's part and parcel of the calendar, you know, something that's a little bit foreign to me. Obviously, that when international break, when international fixtures come around, that you can lose your players. But it's the same for everybody. We've got to get on with it. But we can ill afford it, really, Shaka, at this moment in time. 
And she last one for me. You know, when you and I used to yeah. go at it against each other a few moons ago, to get a free <laughs> kick, to get a penalty, you did had to, you had to take a kick in, or else you weren't getting it. <laughs> You've had a couple of your guys this year who have kind of fallen over. What, what did you say to them, uh, as far as that was concerned? Well, I think in the early parts as well, a lot of the you know we had Christian Aguita who got accused a couple of times, and Carlos Rivas coming from a totally different football, Stevie, and I. I think the most important thing, and I speak about it all the time, is we all know the game's changed now. The stuff that, you know, in our day that used to be able to get away with, you know, I've, I've felt that size 13s of yours many, on many occasions. <laughs> and it's not... I enjoyed giving you them as well, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, I know you did. With great regularity, as I recall. But, uh, no, the game has changed now. And I think that the, sometimes the players don't know where the line is, what they can and can't get away with. Obviously, it's changing. I'm not sure it's for the better. I think last time I looked, football was a contact sport. We're trying to take a little bit away from it. But, hey, a little bit of consistency and uh, no diving about. And let's get on with it because I think we've got a lot of good things going on in MLS. Adrian, we'll let you go in just a moment. Just indulge me for a second. Unbridled success with yeah. Everton in the 80s, of course. Part of that incredible two-time league winners, European Cup winners. Oh, 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 tell me, tell me, tell me. Your one... How long have we got, Ross? <laughs> <laughs> Narrow it down if you can. Your, your one most memorable goal or your one most memorable moment from that glorious era? Um, obviously, scoring the winning goal in the injury time of extra time against Southampton to take us to the FA Cup. Um, playing against Stevie in Liverpool in the first all Merseyside final ever at Wembley in the League Cup final. And when I look back now, because obviously I'm a lot older, I, I think just the, the, the fact that I had seven years at a great club, I realised how special the club was and how special running out at Goodison Park was. So eternally grateful, happy days, and um, let's hope they can come back for them. Thanks so much, Adrian. It's uh, great to talk to you, and obviously we wish you the, all the best for the rest of the season, making the playoffs with Orlando and to many, many more years of successful management. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks, fellas. Welcome back. A little bit of housekeeping for all of your fantasy league players out there. David Silva has now taken away one of Yaya Torre's goals, the first one against West Brom from their opening 3-0 win. So I suppose the goal accreditation panel is uh, playing tricks on us, but that is uh, a little bit of help for David Silva to get off the mark. Let's talk Brazil. Dunga has called up his team for a couple of friendlies in the United States against Costa Rica and the US. There's no Thiago Silva in the back line. And moving further forward, a little bit of positive news for Roberto Firmino, but no Philippe Coutinho. What on earth is going on with the absence of the man who is good enough to build a team around, says Kaká, who is now back in the squad as well, but he's not good enough to play in the Brazilian national team. Dunga says, we gave Coutinho a chance in the Copa America. You can't build with just youngsters. You need experience to help. I think what he's saying there is he didn't make an impression in the Copa America, so why calling up, up for a friendly at this stage? Stevie, your take on the Liverpool man. Well, I'll tell you what, Brazil must have a good team if they can <laughs> let a guy out like this who can do that. I mean, seriously. And, that, and I've heard some excuses, but that, that's a beauty. They don't have a lot of young players for a start. Mm. And they're certainly not going young when they bring in Kaká. Liverpool absolutely will benefit from this. Unfortunately for Coutinho, his, his days as an international seem to be over. Going on what Dunga said, he, that he's looking for a little bit more experience, that he's going to build around that, and that, of course, you can't just win with youngsters. While I understand that you need that veteran presence in the locker room, and while I understand that bringing a player like Kaká perhaps makes sense for Dunga, in the end... All of us sitting in this couch played with youngsters and we all felt if this guy can help us win a game, I don't care how old you are, I don't care where you come from, I don't care who, what your background is, if you can put the ball in the back of the net and you can help us win, that's all, that's all it matters. And so I don't quite understand where Dunga comes across and says, you know what, we don't need Coutinho. I think Brazil is at a point right now to where they can't just pick and choose. A player like Philippe Coutinho, with the sort of performances that he's putting together with Liverpool and the sort of season that, he's had with, that he had with Liverpool last season, and then the beginning of this year, 
the he best has to be in. It's the a best strange team. squad. It's a strange squad, right? He's got Ramirez there, who's a squad player at Chelsea. He's got William, who will work both sides of the ball. He has got Lucas Moura, who loves to go forward. He's got Kaká, who's obviously the luxury player in terms of maybe not his experience, but certainly in terms of what he offers on the field with the ball at his feet. Why not Coutinho? It seems crazy to me that they wouldn't go with him. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm with you in, in, in being <laughs> bemused by, by this all. On, on the one hand, you... But Dunga was certainly criticised for a, a negative style first time around. It doesn't show any real signs of, of being different, though you say Kaka is a flair player. But let's be honest, we, we are talking friendlies. Saying that, World Cup qualifiers start for Brazil in October. The World Cup is still two and a half years away. You cannot tell me that Kaka is going to be a part of Brazil 2018. So, so, the so long if term? not, if he's not, and I don't think he, he, he will be, how can you explain including Kaká and leaving out Coutinho, who let, will probably be in the prime of his career at, at that point. It so makes no sense so to me at so all. So there's no long-term purpose for Dunga, which is a complete disaster for, for, for the Brazilian yeah. team. I mean, what, what, what are they going to do in two and a half years, as, as Shaka says, when, when the World Cup comes around? You know, I know it sounds crazy, but we were talking about it off camera. There's a real lack of talent, comparatively speaking, from some of the Brazil's teams in the past as to what this Brazil squad looks like now. And now Dunga is making this sort of decisions that you just don't quite understand. And he's obviously, obviously has something against Thiago Silva. Because the first thing that he did when he became coach of the national team was, we're going to strip him of the captaincy. And there's got to be an issue that Dunga has with Thiago Silva because he's a guy that starts every game with PSG, and now it's not a first-choice player Do for you know Dunga well, at all. Maybe it answers the, the question about Coutinho as well. Maybe this is just a, a statement in terms of the friendlies in September. They don't mean anything. This is him saying, I'm going to stamp my authority on this because it's about character. I don't like players who cry on the pitch. That's a oh, reference to Thiago Silva. The He's got Marquinhos there who, who doesn't even play at Who's PSG. Who's a yeah, behind Thiago Silva at PSG. The best teams have a mix of experience and youth. Yep. So what Dong has done here is said, you know what, we've got an experienced centre-back here, we'll get rid of him, and we've got a great young player here, we'll get rid of him. Where does that leave him? <laughs> <laughs> Makes no sense. And, None. And, and, they make, uh, and, and not that Brazil is, is that good, as, as, as Ali rightly points out. Embarrassed in, in 2014 World Cup, get knocked out rather cheaply, in my opinion, in the Copa America, yet he's making ho these, these kind of ridiculous changes when he should be looking to focus his squad. Can anyone stop Bayern Munich from claiming an unprecedented nope. fourth title in a row in the <laughs> Bundesliga? They are 1-10 to ten on to win it pre-season. I could play for Bayern and they still win the Bundesliga title. Well, that would change there the odds <laughs> dramatically. Have you still got your gloves? I do. Where are they? I'll, I'll tell you what. They're I'll rather be... clean, just sitting over there. I just keep right. them over there. Ready. I bet, I bet your shorts don't fit you anymore. Your gloves, mate. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not no, sure what you're trying no. to imply. He's now got De Gea playing mutiny a little bit. He's got Romero, but for how long is he going to be a decent enough one, uh, number one for them? Well, he got, <laughs> he's getting away with Romero because he got away with the weekend. You know, to play a goalkeeper who basically has had no pre-season, has, has not played with the players in front of him, was a huge gamble. Now, on this occasion, he came up trumped. Romero ended up being the man of the match. Everything in the garden is rosy. But the fact that Romero has no pre-season behind him means that, you know what, it's going to catch up with him. Mistakes are going to be made. And I think, I think De Gea knows this is going to happen. And this is, this is a perfect time for him to down tools. OK, well, let's take a look at the predictions. Uh, it doesn't seem to have affected okay. how, what we think is going to happen. All right, Shaka. Aston Villa. Manchester United, clear winners on all four. For reason, the deal falls through, mm -hmm. which we've seen happen. That at times, deals that seem they're 100% done, they're not 100% done. And all of a sudden, David De Gea has to stay with Manchester United. How does this then change the dynamic of David De Gea and Louis van Gaal going forward? Well, if, if the deal falls through, David De Gea has shot himself in, in, in the foot. Listen, if, if David De Gea is saying, I'm not playing for now, you know, we're all sitting here, and certainly I was thinking before this statement that, that it was done. It was only a matter of time before he's gone. Mm. If he's coming out and saying for now, that means it's not done. And but the I, fact that he's doing this tells me that he's had enough of van Gaal. Van Gaal criticised him in pre-season. He left him out of the squad at the weekend. This is a little bit of tit for tat, saying, you know what, I'm not playing. If he's saying he's not playing for now, as you put it, Stevie, is also David De Gea saying, I'll be back in soon enough, which, given Sergio Romero's performance in the first game, 
I'm not so sure. And yes, David De Gea was Manchester right. United's best player last season, but possession is nine-tenths of the law, and when you give it up and when you hand it off in, in this manner, I think it reflects badly on you, on your team, and it gives Sergio Romero the opportunity that he's been waiting for. Possession is what? Nine-tenths of the law. <laughs> Just learn something today. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll teach you something every Thank day. Thank you. I appreciate that. that. The, the power play seems to be uh, at stake here for De Gea. Obviously, the Fanal thing, you can pretty much forget that, can't you? This is effectively saying, I'm going to Madrid, whether you like it or not. And doesn't it weaken Manchester United's hand and Van Gaal's hand? Because he's ostracised Valdez. <laughs>Welcome to another edition of ESPN FC with me, Ross Dyer, alongside Steve Nichol, Alejandro Moreno and Shaka Hislop. We've got loads to get through today. We're talking Coutinho, Liverpool and Brazil. We're talking about Cacao. We're talking with Adrian Heath, all things Everton. But before we get to all of that, let's start off with the news that David De Gea has reportedly asked not to be included in Manchester United squad for the Aston Villa game or at the moment given what has been going on with him being dropped from the team. Louis van Gaal has obviously had his say on this. Where do you see this going? What is De Gea playing at? I, I have no idea. And I have to say, on the one hand, uh, for David De Gea to make this request, as, as has been reported, it suggests that the deal is done, he's just biding his time, he wants to make sure he's fit for that move. Saying that, I don't sympathise with that at all. It's, I, I feel, as a player you play. You let the transfer speculation, you let the moves take care of themselves. When you start taking stances like this, I think it reflects badly on you as a player and as a professional, and it should concern Real Madrid. On, on the other, if this is David De Gea trying to play a trump card against Manchester United, who've been stalling themselves, the knock-on effect in the dressing room can hurt Louis van Gaal and, and their own prospects for, for this season. Shaka, let's just say for sake of argument that for whatever 